Institute for Healthcare Research and Quality. And I wanna thank you for joining us today for our second webinar to provide an overview of our current challenge, which is called the Cross-Sectional Innovation to Improve Rural Postpartum Mental Health Challenge. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. I just wanna remind you that the webinar will be recorded and um, I will give you the overview of the agenda. Next slide, please. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the purpose of the challenge and the theme. And then we will have uh, Dr. Beth collins Shuck from the Office on Women's Health providing a substantive overview on the problem of postpartum depression and postpartum mental health. And then secondly, uh, we will have the timeline, prize structure, and submission requirements. We'll also have the evaluation criteria presented and go over the submission process. Finally, at the end of our webinar, we will have a time for questions and answers. If you experience technical difficulties during this webinar, please send in any uh, questions or requests via the chat feature. Everyone is in listen-only mode at this time. So if you have a question, you can send it in through the Q&A. Next slide, please. The purpose of this challenge is to elicit narratives and proposals regarding solutions to address postpartum mental health, diagnosis and treatment in rural communities. And AHRQ will share these narratives with healthcare systems, healthcare professionals, local and state policymakers, federal partners, and the public. AHRQ is interested in both success stories that highlight community achievements and program proposals that demonstrate innovative planning for community action to improve postpartum mental health. We'll talk a little bit more in depth later on in this webinar about the two categories that people can submit to, which are success stories or program proposals. In this challenge, solutions or submissions that are that are sent to AHRQ should highlight successful or promising programmatic interventions to improve rural postpartum mental health. And the people who can submit solutions or submissions through this challenge include healthcare providers, community-based organizations and clubs, faith-based groups, cooperative extension services, hospitals, schools, local health departments, and state, territorial, and tribal organizations. More on the eligibility criteria will be shared later in the webinar. Next slide, please. So it's my pleasure to introduce today, Dr. Beth Collins Sharp. She is the Director of the Division of Program Innovation at the Office on Women's Health within the Department of Health and Human Services. She has a long list of outstanding achievements and she has served as a member of a university institutional review board. She's an outstanding nurse with many honors. She served as the chair of the university's General Clinical Research Center Scientific Research Committee and as the president of the Southern Nursing Research Society. So what we're going to do is turn over the controls to Beth Collins Sharp and she will take, you, take us through her content outlining uh, the different Office on Women's Health and HHS initiatives to address the problem of postpartum depression. Go ahead. Beth, if you're there, I'm not hearing you. Yeah, maybe, your, maybe your microphone. Here we are. There we Better? go. Better? Okay, now. Thank you, we'll try again. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Pleasure to be here with you and to talk about this really important um, topic. Um, I live in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, which is in the Office of the Secretary, where there are, um, among other things, 10 regional offices, the Office of the Surgeon General, Office of Minority Health, the Public Health Service Commission, and of course, the Office on uh, Women's Health. Today, our agenda is um, fairly straightforward. We're gonna start by talking about some basic hormone physiology to find postpartum depression. Then uh, the, the meat and interesting part of the study is to discuss some current research findings. 
and then some HHS activities and resources that may inform your challenge submission. First, though, I'd like to make a distinction between prenatal and postpartum versus perinatal terminology. You'll see perinatal used more and more in the literature and, and will be used in the research that we'll be discussing today. Perinatal is defined uh, simply as the last trimester of pregnancy through about the first month postpartum. This definition may vary um, somewhat depending on the um, practitioner, but in a general sense, peri means around, natal means birth. Um, so in a general sense, it refers to um, um, that, that time period. Postpartum, of course, is after birth, as we all know, and prenatal uh, during the pregnancy. So with that out of the way, let's talk about uh, some of this basic hormone physiology. Um, as we, many of us know, the um, hormones during an average menstrual cycle is pretty much controlled chaos. Uh, please notice that I have um, used the word average on purpose um, because that is what this is. Normal is defined by each individual woman. So whether her period um, starts on day uh, 32 or 27, um, that is um, still normal. So we'll refer to this as an average menstrual cycle. There is um, uh, a rhythm to these uh, to these uh, hormone changes, even though they seem quite drastic in a uh, graph like this. On the other hand, during uh, pregnancy, other than a little jump start at the beginning of the pregnancy to get it started, it's really just a gradual increase in the hormones um, over the course of the pregnancy, quite high, up to 10 times as much as um, would be uh, normal for a hormone change, and certainly the largest change in hormones in an individual's life. Then the question becomes, what happens at that 40 weeks of pregnancy? Does it just immediately drop off back to zero, or how does it get to the, back to this um, quote-unquote normal um, or average set of hormones? And I bring this up because um, it's not possible to line up these uh, two graphs, but you can still see that there's going to be quite a dip in the hormones um, to get to uh, to get to um, your normal. And this happens pretty much in the first seven to three to seven days where these are dropping off, but it still may take two to three months to get back to this um, controlled chaos. Uh, during the postpartum, uh, time period. This is a much better picture, but we've also overlaid on top of this uh, a picture of what happens to the hormones um, during lactation. So there are then these roller coaster ups and downs uh, with certain hormones if the woman is in fact um, breastfeeding. So you can see that the drop is quite precipitous and uh, that um, causes any number of physiologic changes, which will play a part in uh, postpartum depression. So let's define postpartum depression here um, just ever so quickly. Um, there are three quote unquote types of postpartum depression and um, folks will often uh, combine them in one way or another. There's a nice um, diagram in the reference that's lifted, listed here on the bottom, but baby blues is during the first few days when that hormone um, precipitously levels precipitously drop off and um, it causes crying jags, um, anxiety, uh, feeling overwhelmed. Um, I think we're pretty familiar with um, these symptoms. The good news is it's pretty much over by two weeks. The bad news is it takes two weeks. So uh, it can be feel like quite a long time um, to the woman who is going through this. Uh, so then to postpartum depression, this is obviously a more serious um, uh, depression a set of feelings, and it's not just related to the drop in hormones. It is a clinical depression, um, like other types of depression. There's loss of interest in the usual things that she likes to do, persistent sadness, not feeling up to doing everyday tasks, 
It typically starts around two weeks um, postpartum, but don't let that fool you. It may be masquerading itself during the baby blues period. And then finally, postpartum psychosis, which is a um, true psychosis. It's very rare, one to two per thousand women. It includes hallucinations. She both sees and or hears things, paranoia. There's talk of harming herself or the baby. There's persistent thoughts that she just can't get out of her head. Uh, there's lack of interest in the baby. This is a true medical emergency. So if in your um, activities around postpartum depression, you think that someone has postpartum psychosis, um, getting them to um, the ER or a psychiatrist right away is um, an important um, thing to do. And finally, there's talk a lot in the more recent literature about postpartum anxiety. Uh, it's being referenced more and more. For the purposes here, uh, we're gonna sort of fold that into depression. A lot of women with postpartum depression have anxiety. Postpartum anxiety is when is that's the, pretty much the only symptom that um, uh, a woman has. So this um, challenge really does focus on postpartum depression. So let's get back to that. Um, focus. Postpartum depression um, and perinatal mental health conditions are one of the most common complications of the perinatal period. It affects as many as one in seven women. And it's about, um, it's the underlying cause for about 9% of pregnancy-related deaths. So if you didn't think that postpartum depression was a serious thing before, contemplate these two first two bullets and um, hopefully you realize what a serious uh, uh, condition this is. Postpartum depression is associated with lower rates of breastfeeding, uh, startups, poor uh, bonding, increased likelihood of the infant showing developmental delays, and um, infant sleep and eating problems as well. There are some um, professional recommendations uh, and policy recommendations for uh, related to postpartum, postpartum depression. And um, I'll give you an example of three evidence-based ones. The, the one that um, is one of the most recent, which was uh, promulgated in 2019, comes from the US Preventative Services Task Force, which recommends that all adults be screened for depression, including pregnant and part, postpartum women and Clinicians should provide or refer pregnant and postpartum women who are at increased risk for perinatal depression for counseling interventions. So screening is not enough. The referral needs to happen as well. And the, there are all sorts of things to think about um, with referral. It is no longer that you hand a sheet of paper with a phone number on it um, to the woman and, and hope that she goes um, for that um, follow-up uh, work. Uh, the clinical uh, recommendations um, come from a number of sources, and I've just, for time's sake, um, chosen two that happen to be physician, a large physician groups. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommend that obstetric care providers, OBGYNs, screen patients for depression, anxiety symptoms at least once during the peri perinatal period and also conduct a full assessment of mood and emotional well-being at the comprehensive postpartum visits. Similarly, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, have a wonderful recommendation that routine screening for maternal postpartum depression could be, in fact, integrated into well-child vi well -child visits during the postpartum period. So that is um, a depress postpartum depression in a nutshell. Um, I want to uh, jump to the research findings so that we have um, uh, all of our uh, uh, thoughts and resources are research-based and evidence-based. And the most recent um, set of data uh, about postpartum depression um, comes from the CDC about a week and a half ago. And uh, it was part of their MMWR, their Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. And it was called Vital Signs, 
postpartum depressive sim symptoms and provider, provider discussions about perinatal depression. I've underlined postpartum depressive symptoms here because all of the data are referring to um, depression symptoms and not about a diagno diagnosis um, per se. This is because, for a number of reasons. One is that uh, many women may um, have depression symptoms and not have a diagnosis. And the other uh, reason is that the data source is the 2018 PRAMS, uh, the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Mo Monitoring System, and I'll give you um, a reference for that shortly. Um, and the infant birth certificate were the data sources. And the, the PRAMS is a survey questionnaire um, that is self-reported uh, symptoms by the woman, so thus postpartum depressive symptoms. So they ask two very simple sets of questions. Two questions of two. Since your new baby was born, how often have you felt down, depressed, or hopeless? How often have you had little interest or pleasure in doing things? And she answered to these two questions, always, often, sometimes, rarely, or never. And uh, then those women who responded as always or often were coded as having postpartum depressive symptoms. Then the next set of questions ask, during any of your prenatal care visits, did a doctor, nurse, or healthcare worker ask if you were feeling down or depressed? And during your postpartum checkup, did a doctor, nurse, or other healthcare worker ask if you were feeling down or depressed? And obviously this is a yes or no question. So let's see what some of the, see what some of the um, findings were. There were 31 sites that contributed data. A site is most often a state, but it could also be a, a very large city like New York City or um, a, a Commonwealth or territory like a Puerto Rico. So in the 31 uh, sites that presented data um, in uh, 2018, 2017 and 18, uh, the prevalence of self-reported postpartum depressive symptoms was 13.2%, ranging from a low of 9.7% in Illinois and 10.3% uh, in Massachusetts to highs in West Virginia and Mississippi. There were some sites that had been reporting since 2002, and amongst those sites, there was a significant, very small, but significant increase uh, in the annual percentage point of uh, postpartum depressive symptoms that were uh, reported. So either postpartum depressive symptoms were on the rise or they were being reported more often. The groups that exceeded 20%, which would be you know, very important to see uh, uh, with these high-risk groups are those less than 19 years old, American Indians and Alaska Natives, those who smoke during or after pregnancy, those who experience intimate partner violence before or during pregnancy, those who experience depression before or during pregnancy, and those for whom the infant had died uh, since birth. Now those two questions about, did the provider ask about depressive symptoms? During the uh, prenatal visits, the number of uh, providers who ask about depressive symptoms increased significantly from 76 to 79% across 22 sites. And for the postpartum visits, it increased from 84 to 88%. Um, and it varied from a low of 50.7 in Puerto Rico, a midpoint of about uh, 73 to in New York, and uh, highs in Minnesota and Vermont. Now, we just looked at some, develop, uh, some demographic characteristics um, that really line up quite closely with um, these results as well. 
you can look up your states in um, the article um, and your surrounding states if you want to see what's going on in your area. So the take home message is that 13% of the women reported postpartum depressive symptoms. And although there has still been, there has been improvement still, one in five men and women reported they weren't asked about depression during prenatal visits. And one in eight reported that they were not asked about depression uh, during postpartum visits. So this tells us that screening of all women in the perinatal period um, can increase the identification of women, um, perinatal period, I should have said, let me start over so I say that correctly. Screening of all women in the perinatal period can increase identification of women at risk for depression and providing care or referral for the appropriate diagnosis. So now let's look at um, some of the HHS activities and resources that may inform uh, your uh, submission for the challenge. We'll start with the National Institutes of Health, which is very well known, of course, as the largest biomedical research agency in the world. And of course, uh, with recent events, we've heard a lot um, from the NIH uh, lately. NIH and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, uh, that institute has a program called Moms Mental Health Matters, which focuses on depression and anxiety during pregnancy and after birth. I'm gonna circle back around to this program um, at the end, but for now, I'll just show you a couple of their materials. Here we go. Here's one with the uh, red, green, green, yellow, green, as in um, traffic lights um, to help women um, plan an action, have an action plan for what to do if they have some of these depressive symptoms. And here's some general um, nice, uh, posters, um, infographics um, about post postpartum depression and anxiety that are very uh, woman friendly. Now let's go to the Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, HRSA is a, uh, provides health care. It's a health services organization institute. It provides health care to women, to women and people, people overall who are geographically isolated and or economically or medically vulnerable. This includes um, their maternal child health bureau, which has um, uh, block service programs, um, Title V, and they're very well known for their um, maternal infant and early childhood home visiting program which during their um, home visits will uh, screen for uh, postpartum depression using a, a validated tool. Um, this is an example of some of their um, um, materials that they have um, across the, the office. And um, this is a repeat, but it's also about the um, child health, uh, the, the home visits. Um, the statistic that is important from the home visiting program is that 82% of women were screened for depression within three months of enrollment or three months of de uh, delivery in 2019, which was an increase uh, from 75%. So this is an excellent um, screening rate. In addition, um, they have a number of uh, awards and recently they provided in addition to this award, an additional 4.5 million to support seven states in implementing the Screening and Treatment for Maternal Depression and Related Behavioral Disorders Program. This program provides real-time psychiatric consultation, care coordination, and training to help uh, frontline providers screen, assess, refer, and treat postpartum women for depression. The Indian Health Service is uh, not unlike uh, HRSA in that they um, provide services for um, American Indians and Alaska Natives, and this is their um, <clears throat> this is their page uh, about postpartum depression. Of course, we have the Food and Drug Administration, 
FDA is a regulatory agency. They don't provide health services like the uh, two agencies that we just talked about. Of course, then their focus is on um, food and drugs used during pregnancy and during uh, lactation in the postpartum period. And this is their page, um, which provides um, a number of good resources about uh, foods and drugs during pregnancy and uh, lactation. The Centers for Disease Control. Uh, we've heard a lot from the Centers for Disease Control lately. Uh, CDC conducts and supports public health activities. They're a public health agency. They focus on promoting health, preventing disease, and pre preparing for new health uh, threats. So they as well have um, a number of resources. One of the strongest resources that they have are data. And here are four uh, data sources that may be of interest to you. The first though, of course, is the most uh, relevant um, to this particular project. Um, and PRAMS, as I mentioned earlier, was the source for that uh, vital signs MMWR report that we reviewed a little bit. They also support research and this is this PRISM uh, project is a protocol uh, is a program being uh, uh, a program of an RCT randomized controlled trial um, uh, related to uh, perinatal depression in obese settings. Um, so, um, like many agencies, even if they're not primarily a research agency, they do support um, research in order to inform their public health activities. SAMHSA. SAMHSA is a public health agency, a more so a policy agency, though they do provide some, uh, they mostly provide um, support of um, healthcare services that uh, focus of course on behavioral health and to improve the lives of individuals living with mental health and substance use disorders and their families. They focus on programs, policies, information, data, funding, and personnel in order for these services um, to be delivered. So um, this is a lovely resource coming out of uh, SAMHSA. And then circling back to um, my office, uh, we have a um, very active um, social media presence as well as um, our website is uh, very popular. It's an evidence-based uh, website. All content is vetted um, through an evidence-based process. So this is our page for uh, postpartum uh, depression. I'm gonna take you to the page here. This is the live page. For this um, particular uh, page, I have, I intend to take all of the references that I have ref, uh, made reference to today, and I will be adding them to this resource sections here. So this can be um, your go-to place uh, for these resources um, after, after the um, webinar is done. It'll take, take two, three days to get these up. So first of next week, given the holiday, those resources um, should be there. Now, in terms of what we're doing, uh, we uh, um, are planning a, a postpartum depression uh, campaign in, in about two years, where we'll be building off of the mom's Mental Health Matters campaign, which is what I started off with from NIH. And we'll be building um, uh, video digital storytelling um, in order to increase the impact and the representation of the materials that are uh, already developed. All right, so thank you very much. Um, that was a lot in a little bit of time. Um, feel free to contact me afterwards or visit our website starting next week. And um, good luck with your submissions. Great. Thank you very much, Beth. Uh, that was excellent. The very informative.
I would like to just remind everyone, uh, because there was so much information there, that the, the slides will be made public uh, after today's webinar, as well as the recording. Uh, so you'll be able to access all those links and resources. And, and thank you, Beth, for, for uh, working to put those up on the Office of Women's Health website. That's also very helpful. Uh, we're gonna jump now into uh, some challenge logistics. Um, I'll be walking through the timeline and prize structure the submission requirements for the two different submission types and the evaluation criteria, and then a brief overview of how to submit your proposal or your submission. Uh, so looking at the prize pot, uh, as mentioned, we have two different types of prizes. I'm sorry, one other thing to mention, um, just webinar wise, at the bottom of your screen, for those of you logged into Zoom, uh, you should see a Q&A button if you have questions throughout the webinar, you can feel free to submit them now and we will field them as we get to the end of the webinar. So uh, two different categories for submissions, success story categories and program proposals. For the success stories, we will have up to five finalists receiving $15,000 each. And for the program proposals, we will have up to two finalists receiving $50,000 each for a total uh, prize purse of 175,000. Uh, so as of today, we are a month and a half into the challenge. We launched in mid-May. Uh, today is the second of three webinars. There will be a, uh, another webinar in early August hosted by ARC. And the submission deadline is September 15th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, there will be a review and judging happening just after that. And then we expect that the winners will be announced um, in November 2020. Okay, looking now at the submission requirements. Um, the, when we get to the evaluation criteria, the majority of the evaluation criteria are the same for both the success story and the program proposal. Here we wanna talk about uh, the major differences. Um, so when, when we look at submission requirements, we're looking now at the success story. So looking at the description of your solution, the first item here, this will be the majority of your submission. Um, and so you're submitting uh, up to five pages um, and that includes the description of your solution. So what did you do and how did you do it? Um, how did you improve postpartum mental health in uh, the community that you're describing? And then the next item down is a description of that community. So this is where you can bring in data and evidence and, and absolutely talk about the rurality of that community um, for rurality you should be using the rural areas defined by the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA. Um, then get into the barriers. So it doesn't have to be in this order, but ensure that all of these, these items are included in your submission. Um, so in ARC's design of this challenge competition and the research that they conducted to, to design a good challenge, uh, they found that, that these barriers cost access to care childcare and stigma were the ones that stuck out the most. Um, so feel free to highlight those as you, as you write up your submission. However, we are leaving it open to other barriers. If you are aware of others, um, it is important to qualify and quantify those barriers. If you have barriers that, as, as ARC is, is fully aware of the barriers that are here, um, but, but it's important for you to be able to demonstrate how your solution was successful to show how you overcame those barriers. So you have to qualify and quantify those barriers first. The description of the partners engaged, um, this is a brief one here, but it's important. Um, this is an innovation challenge. So uh, were these non-traditional partners? Um, how, how did your partnership come about? Um, you know, what's, what's a little bit of a backstory in, in how you, two entities or however many entities started going after this. Jamie, can I, yes. can I inter interrupt? Your sound keeps breaking up and we're getting some people commenting on it. I don't know if you can adjust a little bit. Okay. Um, I am not sure. One second. Let me just try this.
So we can talk for a second now. Does that seem to be any better? My audio is better now. Can you all hear me? It's still very scratchy. Okay. No, it's it's still very faint and very scratchy. Maybe Priscilla could finish some of this she's offering. Sure. Hi, it's Priscilla Novak again. Can you hear me okay? Sounds great. Okay, so we'll we'll give uh, James Elliott a, a minute or two to work on his sound, and I can just keep going through these slides. Um, so in this category, we're really looking for a comprehensive description of the solution and how the solution um, improves postpartum mental health, how how the community is impacted by the program including proof that the community is a real community, and then a description of the barriers that are reduced for women through the program. We would also like to see a description of the partners that are engaged in the program or solution, and how the solution meets the needs that the challenge seeks to address, including underdiagnosis of postpartum mental health problems, treatment of postpartum mental health problems, the apparent disparity in diagnosis and treatment between privately and publicly insured individuals. And I'll just mention that for that particular subcriterion, if you look on our website, arc.gov, under the challenge um, page, there are references. And in those references, it specifically references um, a study by Laura Sherman and Mir Emily. And in their study, Sherman and Ali had a large sample size of approximately a million people. And they compared diagnosis and treatment between women with Medicaid and women who had private insurance. And what they found was that there was a higher burden of postpartum mental health problems among women with Medicaid. However, women with Medicaid waited longer to get treatment. Another solution that um, your particular submission might address is how your solution helps solve rural health workforce shortages. And you can submit with uh, a document or your document can also have a short video included. The short video is not mandatory, but if you would like to include it as a part of your submission, you're certainly welcome to do that. And I'm getting a message that James Elliott is back. Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're so much better. Thank you so much. I think we're Thanks. ready for the next slide. All right. Thank you very much. And, and apologies, everyone. Uh, thank you for covering that, Priscilla. So looking now at the program proposal, uh, this is two slides long. Um, so very similar in that the same elements need to be discussed, um, but differences in, in the way that, that you approach them, which is what we want to highlight here. So again, um, the program proposal is also a five-page submission. Um, you will have the opportunity for an appendix for the program proposal, which we'll discuss in just a minute. So again, the description of the community to be impacted, um, and that shall include rurality, um, with those HRSA rural areas, as mentioned before, but in case you couldn't hear me, those are the rural areas defined by the Health Resources and Services Administration. 
the description of the plan to improve postpartum mental health diagnosis and treatment. The plan for the proposal, it's not that it's more important than, than how you went about achieving your success story, but the plan has to have certain elements to show why you're going to be successful. And that's what makes it important here in the program proposal. So this is not a grant, so you do not need to submit a budget. Um, but you should be in some ways narrating a project plan that can describe how you'll control cost, how you'll control scope, how that scope will speak to solving this problem in a given community. Um, so it, it, is a, it is somewhat of a different mindset um, to go after the program proposal than the success story. Um, so then the plan should include how you will reduce those barriers for women. Those are the same barriers as discussed in the success story. And again, if you have others, feel free to show them. Please qualify and quantify them so that we can see how your plan will be effective. A description of the team. So uh, again, a little bit different here. You're talking about the partnerships, um, how you all will work together through the plan. Um, whose who's different roles and responsibilities, uh, where different roles and responsibilities will fall in that team, uh, and how you'll work over the designated timeline. And then a description of the plan to engage community resources. So in the success story, you talked about how you did this, but how will you, you know, a big focus of innovation challenges and something that, that ARC is certainly focused on is the, the concept of user-centered design bringing users into your solution building as you're doing it and getting that good feedback to make sure that your solution is the right one for that community uh, and being able to iterate and, and, and change if you need to uh, based on that feedback. So how will you engage your community and bring those elements in? Um, how the plan meets the needs of the challenge. So this is under diagnosis, uh, disparity in diagnosis and treatment. Uh, between privately and publicly insured individuals, and then the rural health workforce shortage. Um, this is another area where if there are others, you can define them as well. Uh, but again, um, qualifying and quantifying is very important to show that impact. The next piece is the appendix that I mentioned. Uh, for the partnership, uh, you can provide an appendix of, with letters of support from those community partners. And you may also, as with the success story, submit uh, a short video. This is an optional step, um, but encouraged um, as, as if anything helps. So uh, those are the submission requirements. We'll now go into the evaluation criteria. So the evaluation criteria are very, very similar between the two submission types, success stories and program proposals. The only difference is past tense versus future tense. So I will cover these just once, but both are included in the slide there. Um, <clears throat> so first, the community assessment. Uh, the submission describes the community of interest. Um, so this is where you're providing data um, of, and evidence about that community, what the need is, um, what those challenges are, those barriers in that community. Uh, partnership. What does that partnership look like? How is it formed and, and um, how are you achieving these goals together? The logic model. So this is, this is really the evidence of the success of your solution, right? Um, or the success of your plan as, as proposed. So the, um, the for example here is the inputs, processes, outputs, and outcomes. Uh, these, are, these are important to focus on, every one of these. Um, and an important thought exercise in writing up your proposal is, is okay, what were our, our inputs? Uh, what were our drivers for this? Where did we get our information from? How did we get information from the community in order to build this out? And then evidence of meeting the programmatic goals. So a success story and a program proposal both have a beginning and an end. Um, and in the beginning, there was a problem, and in the end, um, you know, at best, the problem is eradicated. However, we know uh, healthcare. Um, so, how did you move the needle? How will you move the needle? How will you be effective? And how will you continue to be effective? 
Um, so that's the evidence of meeting the programmatic goals. Capacity to disseminate. So this is with the video um, telling a clear and compelling story in your in your optional video um, and and in, also in your documents. Um, this the the innovation part of this is perhaps doing something non-traditional, uh, perhaps doing something that's been done before, but in a non-traditional way with non-traditional partners. How do you capture that essence of innovation? Um, the rurality and category identification, these are pass-fails. So again, um, evidence that it's in a rural area, and we have the link here to the HRSA rural areas and the category identification. Uh, this piece is important here. It's clearly defined when you end up submitting in the platform, which I'll show you. Um, but ARC is asking that each team um, submit only one, either a success story or a program proposal. So um, please take that into account as you're considering what your submission should be. Okay. So again, the evaluation criteria for the proposal are identical. Um, the partnership piece for the program proposal calls out uh, digital partners, um, evidence that the, the partner support for partnership is provided. Um, so that's, you know, your, your agreements. You don't have to provide your agreements. We just need to know that agreements do exist. Um, and then the same pass-fails exist. Um, and evaluation metrics, actually, this is uh, a tad bit different. So what metrics would be collected during the implementation? Uh, so this is how you will demonstrate success as you implement your project. Okay. And then lastly, we're going to get into just the submission process. This is, these are just screenshots of the platform. So once you have reviewed all of the materials and gone through the entire ARC website um, and you've written up your proposal and you have your supporting documents, uh, you will go back to the ARC website and click to enter the challenge. You'll be brought to our challenge platform and you will click join challenge. Once you're ready, you can click submit solution. So you'll join a challenge, you'll create an account on the platform. You can create teams on the platform. If you have a team it is uh, of people, which you likely do, it is not required that every team member have an account on the platform. Uh, but if you would like to, you may. Um, one person can submit on behalf of a team. So you'll click Submit Solution. And then here is the, the Submission Builder page. This may be a little bit difficult to see, uh, but number one is your submission title. Um, then your submission type is number two, so that's the success story or program proposal. So by completing that field, you will by default pass um, as long as you submit one type for your team. Um, and the enter your URL for an optional video. So the videos will not be uploaded to the platform. You should post them somewhere. It is possible to post them on YouTube or Vimeo, or if you have a private site, in a private mode, so that only those with the link can view it if you don't want the video to be public. Um, then choose a file to upload. So this is where you'll upload your submission file. For your success story, this should be your up to five page um, write up. For your proposal, this would also be your five-page write-up, but you can submit additional files. Um, and so you can submit those letters of support if they're not all combined into one document. And then once you've uploaded, click Submit. So all of those files roll into one submission. And then you can see on the submission page once you've submitted your submissions. So at the time of the close, 5 p.m. Eastern on September 15th, ARC for each individual or for each team will take the most recently submitted submission. So if you have multiple, we will take the one that sits at the top. Um, you can feel free just to be safe if you have multiple to withdraw um, or remove older submissions. And with that, we will now turn over to questions. So again, feel free to use the Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen, and we will field the questions here. So uh, the first question, can solutions be submitted 
that haven't yet been used with rural populations but seem promising for rural populations? Or does there need to be a certain amount of encouraging data on this already? Um, so this, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but this sounds like a program proposal submission type. And if that's the case, then as long as you feel that there is sufficient data or, or sufficient evidence that your plan could work, um, then we absolutely encourage you to submit. Um, and I do think if you have, if, there's a, if, if solutions haven't been used with rural populations, another assumption is that the submission has been used with other types of populations. So I think if there's evidence that it has worked with others and with any gaps, you can demonstrate how you could make it work with a rural population. I certainly think it's, it's worth submitting. Priscilla, did you have anything to add on that? Hi, it's Priscilla. So I think in regard to this question, what I would say is that the evaluation criteria on community assessment would be very important. And then also any available references on why the intervention that's proposed it would work. So any sort of evidence that you can supply that something similar was attempted in a similar community, an explanation of a logic model that documents that the inputs or the activities are um, based on prior best practices or evidence-based curriculum or an evidence-based intervention. So I think that it could be something that hasn't been used in a rural population yet, if that's the question. If it's just about something that's evidence-based but you're using it with a rural population for the first time, that would be a possibility. But in any case, I think that you have to make the clear case of why you believe that the program would work for the population that you intend to use it with. Thanks. So the next question, when would funding start? January 2021, can um, PhD students or postdocs apply? So this, it, again, is not a grant proposal. Um, and this is also not a phased challenge in that uh, ARC has run other phased challenges where a proposal is submitted, a certain number of ideas are selected and receive a kind of first round of, of award money. Uh, and then go off to do the work and at the end of that phase demonstrate to compete for um, who was the most successful in that phase. This is not that kind of challenge and challenge competitions by nature are award money, um, not, um, not grant money. So they are not in any way committed to work to be performed beyond the challenge close date. Um, so funding would be distributed uh, probably within 30 days of the announcement, which we anticipate to be November of this year. Um, and yes, PhD students or postdocs are eligible to apply. Um, and then the, the next question kind of ties into this, which is, is this open for profits as well as not for profits? Absolutely. Um, we do encourage you to go to the ARC website, to the challenge website, and view the basic eligibility criteria for all submitters to make sure that you meet those before submitting your solution. The next question, is a video required for the success story? The capacity to disseminate features video as an important, important criteria. The, the video for both success story and program proposal is optional, however, encouraged. It's always helpful to be able to showcase your work in another way. Um, so we do encourage it, but it is not required. Okay. So a question, are proposals limited to US rural populations or can proposals include international rural communities? Priscilla, do you wanna take this one? Sure, this is limited to US rural populations. Okay. 
Next question, can we build a current research or demonstration project with specifics for rural mothers or does this need to be a new project? Hey, it's Priscilla. Would you like me to provide an answer to this question? Yes, please. Thank you. So all submissions will be evaluated based on the evaluation criteria that are listed on our website. And in terms of the question of whether it could be something existing or something new, you would need to explain if it's a success story, how your existing submission was successful. So it, like Jamie said, pretty much the different subparts of the evaluation criteria are the same for both success stories and program proposals. Um, is it a program proposal to start doing something new in a community where it's not done before, but you did something similar in some other community? You would likely include metrics on the impact of your prior work but then would also need to bring in the community assessment for the community where you propose to actually do the new intervention. So you would have to have some sort of evidence that your intervention will work and then also a description of the community that would be impacted by the program. Thank you. So the next question, would Puerto Rico be an acceptable proposal area for this award? Priscilla, would you take that one? So that part of the eligibility criteria is the area where the program it has been done, if it's a success story, it would be done if it's a program proposal, is defined by the Health Resources and Services Administration as a rural area. This is somewhat related to, the, to another question that also came in about what qualifies as a community. The chief demographic area or catchment area where the program was done if it's a success story or will be done if it's a program proposal must be defined by the Health Resources and Services Administration as rural and it must be part of the United States and affiliated territories. So Puerto Rico is acceptable as long as the intended catchment area where the program would be done is defined as rural. Okay. Thank you. So the next question, do you have to be partnered with a mental health agency to participate in the challenge or could an individual participate alone? So it is absolutely possible for an individual to participate alone. It is only important to note that you have to be able to demonstrate everything that we went over in the submission requirements and review criteria, evaluation criteria, and that is your ability to um, to engage a community um, and get feedback from them and carry out a successful project plan. We have seen it done. We have absolutely seen it done with individuals. Um, just want to note that. And so, yes, it is. You do not have to be partnered with a mental health agency. We just want to call out. Um, your ability to demonstrate all of the things that we went over. Okay. At this time, we have no other open questions. We'll leave it open for a few more minutes to see if any others come in. We do have another question that's come in. We have a new question here. If the submission relies on a software that has yet to be built, do we need to have a contract in place 
to build the software, or could the award be used to execute that? I I believe, Priscilla, I would I would ask you to jump in here, but I I believe that as long as your your program proposal demonstrates your capacity to reduce the barriers uh, for mental health in a rural community using that software solution and a clear implementation plan for that software solution and its rollout um, and, the, and the user acceptance that will happen uh, to take that software in um, or to integrate it with existing health systems, I do believe that it's, it's absolutely possible to, to do what you're, what you're talking about. Priscilla? Thank you. So it could be an app or software type of solution, but the main thing to keep in mind is that 20, approximately 20% of the evaluation points come from the community assessment. So if it is an app or a software related intervention that's going to be used to deliver the intervention to a rural area, it's very important to be able to supply the information and data on the rural area that would be benefited by your app or by your software. It's a very good point. Thank you, Priscilla. Sure. So at this time, we have no other open questions. I'd, I'd like to leave it open for maybe another 30 seconds just to see if any new questions come in. And once we reach that point, if no other questions come in, we will um, give final words for the, for the webinar. Um, so we did get another question, and the question was, are there any particular credentials you might need to have to participate as an individual? The credentials of the individual are not considered within the evaluation criteria. You are free to inform us of whatever credentials you might have, but if not part of the formal evaluation criteria and all submissions will be evaluated based on the criteria that's listed on our website. So since there are no other questions coming in, I want to thank all of you for joining us on this webinar. I especially want to thank Beth Collins Sharp for your wonderful presentation. That was very informative and also engaging. So we thank you so much for your support of this challenge. And to all of you who have participated in the Zoom meeting, we will be posting the slides and the recording on our website probably in the next 10 business days. And if um, our next webinar in the series will be on August 5th, 2020. Thank you all. You may disconnect at this time.